Good day, this is Shauna Casey, and welcome to this SOS educational webcast, The Spin Cycle, Don't Let Your Transaction Fade. Due to the large number of attendees, no conference call service is available for this webcast. The sound will broadcast through your computer speakers. However, if you wish to ask a question at any time during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions and answers panel of your GoToWebcast console, and we will do our best to answer them as they come in. Any questions that we don't get a chance to address during the webcast, we will follow up, we will follow up afterwards with an email. This morning we sent an email with a link to the presentation materials to everyone that registered as of 10 a.m. Pacific this morning. You can also find the link to the materials under the Event Resources tab on your GoToWebcast console. This session will also be recorded, and we will send a link to the recording and materials in the next day or two. I hope that all of you are familiar with Stock and Option Solutions, or SOS, as we are more commonly known. For those of you who are not, SOS is a leading stock administration staffing, consulting, and outsourcing firm within the equity compensation marketplace. SOS provides interim and permanent placement, expert project resources, and total outsourcing solutions. To learn more, you can visit us online at www.sos-team.com or call us at 888-SOS-0199. Next, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today's session. We are pleased to have Julie Kenya and Sorrell Johnson on the panel today. Julie began working in equity compensation in 1993, managing the AT&T Long-Term Incentive Program. She led the stock administration team during AT&T's challenging years of corporate transactions up through the final acquisition of AT&T Corp by SBC Communications. Julie joined the team at SOS in 2006 and has been assisting clients with an extensive array of projects, including mergers, acquisitions, spin-offs, stock option exchanges and repricings, conversions, vendor searches, stock plan best practice reviews, training, day-to-day -day administration, and accounting-related reconciliations. Julie became a certified equity professional in 2008 and is a member of the Professional Services Group at SOS. Sorrell began working in equity compensation in 1997 and has held equity management positions at NetApp, Redback Networks, and Ariba, an SAP company. She currently works for Stock and Option Solutions as a senior equity compensation consultant. And she speaks at various events, including industry webinars, the NAS National Conference, GEO, and NAS University. Her areas of expertise include employee stock purchase plans, spin transactions, mergers, and acquisitions. And she also has experience in global equity compliance in over 50 countries. Sorrell received her Certified Equity Professional designation in 2003, and she is a member of the Professional Services Group at SOS as well. Next is our standard disclaimer slide. We'd like to remind you to consult your own advisors before making any changes. As I mentioned, the materials are available on our website, and here again is the link. Thank you all for joining us today, and with that, I'll turn this presentation over to Sorrell, who will introduce our topic and cover the agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna. So first of all, today's webcast is going to be a little bit different than others you may have attended. Normally, you come to a webcast with questions, and you're looking for answers. And here, we're just going to give you more questions. And the reason that we're going to do that is we are going to give you the questions that you need to ask to have a successful spin transaction. No spin trans no spin two spin transactions are the same. There's always something that is different about each one. So you can't just take a blueprint and say, oh, I've done it this way before. I can do it that way again. Not the case. But we can give you the list of questions that you can ask to be successful. And with that, our agenda today is we're going to talk about exactly what is a spin-off, what happens to the equity awards during a spin-off, their treatment, who is on the spin team, the myriad of complications for the equity department, administrative issues that come up, internal compliance, I'm sorry, international compliance issues and questions you should be asking, accounting issues, 
issues that you will have with shareholders, even though you are not investor relations, and the importance of communication during this whole process. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to talk about what is a spinoff. Thanks, Sorrell. What's a spinoff? Well, there is a, a true definition that the Securities and Exchange Commission um, provides, and, and we've noted that here for you. Uh, it's basically the separation of the business or a piece of the business into two parts. So we typically see a spinoff where the original company or the whole company, as you see in the top big box, decides to separate its business into two pieces, one being what we would call the Remain Co. or the new company, and the second piece being the Spin Co. And the, you know, that is the new company as well. Uh, it can be very complicated and it can be very uh, intricate as to how they actually split, but in the end, we end up with two halves equaling what was a whole. And in, in some cases, you actually see where uh, there is a transaction done within the, the parent company or the original company where the spinoff uh, is done uh, on paper internally. Uh, they rearrange the company and then go through this uh, regulatory type spinoff. It, it's very, very complicated. And it, there's as Sorrell said, never one way uh, that you follow does it, does it actually work. Um, there are you know, a number of different ways that a transaction can actually occur. So um, what we need to be reminded of, and Sorrell, let's just go to the next slide here, sorry. Uh, there are a number of ways that we identify what a spinoff is, how it's happening, and what are some of the key dates that we need to be aware of. Uh, sometimes you might hear throughout the, through your company, maybe through the grapevine, that, hey, there's something happening. Uh, you're the stock plan administrator. You've been hearing rumors, but nobody has actually told you what's happening. Uh, so you are a little bit cautious about that. You're looking for information and it's difficult to find. Uh, typically what we see happening is a Form 10 is filed by the SPINCO. It's not filed by the parent company, and that can be confusing because you're assuming that the company that you're currently uh, part of, the original company, you're assuming they must be filing something to indicate that a spinoff is happening. But in fact, it's actually the SPINCO or the new company that's going to be created or spun off that files the Form 10 that actually indicates to the Securities and Exchange Commission the desire to be a new company as a spinoff of the former company. And in those filings, there will be things like a record date, and the record date uh, tends to establish for the shareholders what exactly uh, is going to happen with the dividend of the new company shares or the spin company shares. It's very much like declaring a dividend normally. There's a record date and there's a payable date. In this case, the payable date is also the spin date, and that is the date that the two companies actually separate and become independent companies trading separately uh, on the various stock exchanges. And then, of course, there's something called the distribution date, and that's when the shares are actually deposited into the shareholders' accounts. And you're never going to know exactly when these dates are going to happen. Uh, I have found throughout my life of doing spinoffs that there's a general idea that it might be happening in a time frame, but you don't actually know the date uh, until maybe a week before, sometimes two weeks before, sometimes not until the day of. So it's a very, very tricky process. Uh, and it, there's a lot of moving parts in, in involved with a spinoff from the securities exchange um, perspective right on through any regulatory issues and so on and so forth. So let's go to the next slide and talk about once we decide and learn that, that there actually is a spinoff, 
uh, what happens to the equity in the spinoff. And this is something that should be contemplated well in advance of the actual final date. It shouldn't be something that is uh, decided at the final moment. It has to be um, kind of hashed out, if you will, early on in the process. And typically what we see happening is uh, three approaches here that we've outlined for you where the equity is separated and concentrated into what we would call the employment approach, where every employee, wherever they end up, whether it be with the original company or whether it be with the spin company, ends up with equity in the company that they are finally employed with. Another approach that we see is the basket or bucket or portfolio, and you can see it has many names here, shareholder approach. Uh, and this is where employees end up with both companies, and they have equity in both companies regardless of where they ultimately end up being employed. That is a little bit tricky, and we'll talk about that further. Uh, there is also a hybrid approach, and a hybrid can mean that you might have a combination of both, uh, maybe some equity that was offered between certain grant dates might be treated one way, uh, vested equity might be treated a different way. And another approach with the hybrid that we have started to see more recently uh, and more frequently are some cash out approaches, and that means that any equity that uh, the, the company decides they no longer want to uh, provide to the individuals. They decide a way to actually cash that out with a cash payment. Uh, that can also be uh, problematic because there may be some entitlement issues, um, international issues. So it gets a little tricky to do the cash out piece, but these are sort of the, the, the main forms of equity adjustments that we are seeing in spinoffs, and as you can see, there's quite a few of them. So how do you know what your company is going to be doing and when they're going to be doing it or how they're going to be doing it? Well, you really don't know unless you are provided that information well in advance. Uh, we typically see that happening at the time the spinoff is being talked about we'll see that within the, 10, uh, the Form 10 or some subsequent filings, there'll be details about how they're going to actually treat the equity. And what we have learned over the years is that this is something that's usually done well in advance by a little internal team called a board of directors and the internal compensation consultants and maybe legal counsel and some higher management folks. And they've decided that we're going to spin off a company and here's what we're going to do with equity. And then they're going to sort of pass that down through the ranks and get a sense of, can we do this? Finance may come back and say, eh, that's not going to work so well. And tax may be involved. And then, of course, the, the last folks that actually get pulled into this are typically the, the human resources and the stock administration team uh, that says, oh, you know, um, we, what are we doing with equity? And we find out, oh, well, what we're doing is we're going to do this, and, and human resources and uh, maybe stock administration says, well, uh, we can't accommodate that within our current systems or platforms, and we need to find a way to do that. Or human resources says, well, you know, that's going to be a communication nightmare. How do we make everybody feel important and feel connected? And, and that's uh, been a, a challenge, I think, for most of the spins that I've seen is having this team where everybody, the board of directors right on through to your auditors, um, have an understanding of what needs to happen, when it needs to happen. And from a stock administration perspective, you want to be on that team as quickly as you can and, and knows your way in if possible. The other folks that tend to be at the bottom of the barrel, and, again, and I would just point out that these bullets are in no way referring to the list of people who know first, but uh, what we have seen is auditors tend to get involved, but maybe too late in the process. And then we've gone through the conversion, and we've adjusted the equity, and all of a sudden the auditors go, well, this doesn't quite work 
great for us. And then we have to go back and, and uh, readjust. Uh, so that, that can be a little problematic. So you want to make sure that you're in on the team and everybody is included early on. Um, I think that's very, very important to make sure that you're a piece, you're a piece of that. Would you not agree, Sorrell? I, I absolutely agree. In fact, the last thin transaction that I did, we had a weekly meeting and basically finance, legal, tax, HR, stock, we all came to the table. We spent an hour every Thursday afternoon discussing, you know, basically the hot topic, the urgent topic, sharing what our department had come up with, you know, and just bringing information to the table so that everybody knew what was going on. Yeah, that, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, there are a lot of complications. So, Sorrel, you want to talk about what you've seen recently? Sure. So, if this all isn't enough for you, um, a lot of companies take the opportunity on of a spin to change vendors. Now, changing vendors are usually a project that takes two to three months on its own. But if you're a large company and you're splitting yourself, say, maybe into a medium and a smaller size company, and suddenly you're, you don't feel that a full service broker is what you can afford anymore, you're going to go more for a discount broker, or maybe you've had issues with one of your vendors previously, and you're taking the opportunity to move to a new vendor and make a clean start. This is something that frequently pops up. And companies say, well, you know, do we just kind of rip the Band-Aid off and do it all at once? Or do we leave this until after the spin, we're settled, and then after all the employees have been through all this upheaval, then we move them over? You know, honestly, there's no good time to ever change vendors or providers when you've been with one for a long time. In my opinion, it doesn't really matter. It's you either do a whole lot of the work all together or you have a whole lot of work for a longer amount of time. It, it just it does not matter. Now, if this happens to you, first of all, I'm sorry. And secondly, there are some things that you need to think about. First is, where is the employee stock history going to reside? If you're moving from broker ABC to broker XYZ, the employee is going to have two accounts. And you need to make sure that you know how long they're going to have two accounts. How long will broker ABC leave those accounts open? Are there going to be any fees for the employees? All the questions you need to ask. And so, you know, make sure you know every last detail because when we get to communication, it's going to be key that you know all the details. And you also want to make sure that your cost basis is going to transfer over. And your cost basis that you receive from broker ABC may need to be adjusted depending on what kind of shares are coming over, uh, what the terms of the deal are, if there's a cash payout. Keep that in mind because you're, you're definitely going to need that information. Broker XYZ is going to ask for it. Now, if you do change vendors, there's also going to be the question, management's going to say, well, can't we just have a bulk transfer of shares? Now, let's back up a minute and talk about what a bulk transfer is. A bulk transfer basically means that the broker goes in and they pull all of your employees' shares in your company and they move them over to the, they put them out there for the new broker. The new broker grabs them and deposits them into employee accounts. Now, brokers usually do this one of two ways. They'll call it a positive consent or a negative consent bulk transfer. So negative consent means that the old broker sends a letter or they call the employee and they say, on such and such a date, 
we are going to transfer over all of your shares to your company's new broker unless we hear from you. If we hear from you, your shares will stay here. Now, positive consent, and this is the nightmare for stock administrators, is the broker says, well, we're not going to move anything unless the employee signs our form, which means that you get to send out the forms, and you get to collect the forms, and you get to tabulate the forms for the broker, send them back, then they take a specified amount of time. Normally, they like to have about a week to go through and check and make sure that they have all of the shares pulled properly, and then they send them over to your new broker. Now, that in itself is difficult, but keep in mind, you need to ask about the timing. When are you going to do this bulk transfer? Are you going to do the bulk transfer prior to the spin? Are you going to do it on the spin date? Keeping in mind that on and about the spin date, you're going to be adjusting outstanding equity awards, which means you're going to have a lot on your plate then. Are you going to do it during a blackout that might happen after the spin? Or possibly are you going to do it later on down the road, maybe say 60 days after the spin? Now, some companies say, we don't care about bulk transfer. We're just going to let employees have their shares where they have their shares. They want to leave them at the old broker, that's fine. Here's the problem. If you have an ESPP, that means you're tracking dispositions from two brokers, possibly into systems that won't talk to each other. So in the old brokerage system, if the broker even agrees to continue tracking dispositions for you, you're going to have to find a way to get that information into your new system. Additionally, for other long shares, you're going to have ISO tracking that you're going to need to do for the same reason, for the disposition tracking. And that can turn into quite a challenge, shall we say. Now, outside of the whole changing vendors and providers and the bulk transfer and everything that comes with it, you also have to ask, is there going to be a cash distribution along with the stock? Again, this may reduce the employee's cost basis in the shares. And you do want to make sure that you do have a correct cost basis because the broker will then turn around and disclose that cost basis to the employee. And you also should be asking, are there any planned reductions in force? Now, lots of times, it, it, it seems kind of counterintuitive when we talk about a reduction in force when we're splitting into two companies and we basically need two of every position. But there will be some times when maybe they'll take the opportunity to close down a department in one of the companies. So you need to ask, when are these reductions in force planned? Will the employees be let go on the spend date, prior to the spend date, after the spend date? If it's after the spend date, where do these risk employees go? Are they going to spend co? Are they going to stay with New co, how is this going to be handled? And again, this is something that you need to get out in front of, and you need to make sure you know yeah, well before Sorrell, the actual spending. Yeah, Sorrell, to that point, I've actually seen some cases where there were some very large rifts as a result of the spinoff, and the decision was to treat those people differently than the other people. <laughs> Which is another complicating factor, right? So we've we've already um, you know we, we've already talked a lot about complications just on one slide here, and you know the, now the riff is just another piece that adds to that whole complexity. So wow! Yeah. Now again, like we said, no, there's no no two spins are alike, and that's one I've not seen, thankfully. <laughs> Um, we did have a question, and I, actually the question that's come up, I'm going to address it shortly um, in one of my upcoming slides. So if we can just hold on to that question, that will be great. Okay. Go ahead, Sorrell. Sorry. All right. So moving on, more complications. Uh, 
the equity plan is probably going to have some amendments. If the original company, Remain Co., doesn't do a reverse stock split, then it probably you probably won't have any changes. However, frequently Remain Co. will do something like they'll have a reverse stock split. Possibly they'll change their name. And that means you're going to have amendments to the equity plan. Now, Benco, they're going to have whole new plans. And their plans will, be, will most likely be approved by the sole shareholder while they are still part of the parent company. And that will usually be immediately prior to the spinoff, which is very handy because they say, oh, well, we don't need to get all of this together. You know, we'll, you know, give us 30 days after this then to get you all of the documents. Well, employees are going to want their grant, and you're not going to have any paperwork. So make sure you say, guys, I, I know 30 days after seems reasonable to you, but I really need to have these much sooner, especially if you have online grant agreements. You know, it might take you a week to get everything set up and, and posted. Now, also, you may have, if you have these new award agreements, and they are required, are you going to require people who have already accepted their awards to reaccept them? They may have already vested. You may have already released shares under an RSU. In Remain Co., are you going to say to these folks, look, I know you accepted once before, but I need you to accept again? You might want to. You might not. It's a question you need to ask. Or you may just want to send out a communication that says, your new awards are posted. Please make sure you take a look. They're for informational purposes only. Now, Section 16 filings get really interesting for spin code because they are required at spin. And the date that spin co is spun off of the parent company and the date that they begin trading aren't necessarily the same date. So that's something to keep in mind. It might be, but it might not. And as a further wrinkle, they may appoint the officers far in advance of the company being spun off. So again, you really need to keep an eye on that and keep in communication with the legal department so that they can tell you when those filings are going to be due. Yeah, and now, and Darrell, I actually uh, had a situation recently where uh, with the Section 16 officers, we had to do their calculations and their adjustments sort of on the back of the envelope so that they could meet the filing deadline. And then uh, the more complex conversions were done after the fact. And if there were any adjustments that were needed because there was a, you know, a share difference or some little rounding difference, they had to amend the filings. But in order to meet the deadline, uh, it was done on the back of an envelope. There was no other way to do it because of the complexity of the conversion and the fact that they weren't going to actually have the exchange ratios until the day of the merger. So that it, time did not allow us to do the form filings in time unless we did it that way. And that's interesting because the last one I worked on, they appointed the officers far enough in advance that they their counsel took the position that they filed blank form three, Not saying me. that, well, the officers didn't hold anything in Spenco. All of their equity awards were in Remainco. And then they amended them later on down the road to put an accurate picture in. So that's interesting. Again, there is no right answer in any of these <laughs> questions. They're just questions that need answers. So Julie had talked about the equity adjustments 
And how are you going? What what approach are you going to use? Are you going to use basket? Are you going to use shareholder? Are you going to go for hybrid? You have to decide early on who owns the decision making process. And they need to make sure that they have fully communicated and that they've developed the actual adjustment rules and the formulas. This is not something that will be set in stone when you hear the first rumor about how equity awards will be treated. Uh, in my recent transaction, they had performance stock units, and they went through four different treatments of how they were going to deal with the PSUs before they eventually decided on what treatment they, they, they had that they were going to go with. One thing that you do need to bring up when everybody's talking about this is if you can, you need to make sure that the adjustment doesn't land the participant in a position where they have taxable income. Now, generally, this won't be the case. Because when you're adjusting outstanding equity awards only, not, not long shares that they may hold, but just equity awards, probably you're going to have some sort of ratio that won't bring about a taxable gain. You'll also need to know who's responsible for this, but how are they going to communicate to stock and to any vendor that you may have assisting you in performing the adjustment. Make sure that you set up timelines and processes to ensure that the data is passed in a timely manner and that it's correct. You don't want to have to go to your vendor and say, oh, our ratio is, is 3 to 1, and then come back later in the day and say, oh, no, wait a minute, it's, I'm sorry, it's 4 to 1. That is a nightmare. And again, you don't want to start making changes in your system if you're the one doing the heavy lifting until you know you have final data. And one other thing to think about here, and Julie kind of brought this up about the auditors. They don't necessarily get in or get invited in. You might want to invite the auditors in. Now, you will probably never hear me say that any other time. But when we, <laughs> when we start talking about these final formulas, there have been a couple days where you can take the formula and the auditors, either internal or external, can look at it. They can re-perform the calculations and say, yes, you know what, we sign off. We think that's the right number. Because it will save you a lot of heartache to give them a day or possibly two to audit the work that the vendor or the finance department has done on this end, rather than them raise the red flag after you push live data back out to employees that's been converted, and they go, oh, we don't think that you used the right number. So maybe invite them to the party early on. Julie, anything else that I missed that you can think of? No, I think that you really did cover it. Um, one little experience I had with that is the auditors had told me all along that they were well on board and they were happy with what I was uh, helping the, the, the client with. And then ultimately the night before the spinoff, the auditor said, oh, you know what? We really didn't look at your conversion um, reconciliation, so we didn't understand what you were doing. And now we, we look at it. We have some questions. And that was the night before. So to Sorrell's point, if you can get them involved early, it, it's actually better rather than later. Um, and so that sort of brings us to those administrative issues now. And um, this is where the complications for equity really start to come to be, right? You're on the administration top side. You're the stock admin person. And all of a sudden, this all starts to creep in, and here you go. Um, the spin date, as we said earlier, the record date, the distribution date, whatever you want to call it, we like to call it creeps. Um, there's, it's never set in stone. You never know when it's going to happen, as I said earlier. It just sort of happens. 
So you need to be prepared ahead of time. And what we try to tell folks is test, 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 test. So once you figure out where things might be going, um, then you can start to test different scenarios and see where there's going to be some issues so that you can be prepared. With the ESPP, what we have seen happen most recently is that the, um, for the Remain Co, as Sorrel mentioned earlier, the plan usually doesn't change, right? It's always going to be the same. Nothing really changes. Maybe the company name, or if they do a reverse um, split, then there might be a change. But nothing uh, too significant there for the ESPP for the Remain Co. With the folks in the Spin Co, there are changes. We generally would see that they would be excluded from any new purchase, or if the purchase date is happening on or near the spinoff, they might um, not be able to participate. There might be a new plan that gets put into place. And that may not happen until after they're actually functioning as a new company because of timing to get those plans up and running. So there are some complications with that that you need to know uh, what, from an administration point of view, you would need to do if you need to exclude people or include people or create the new plan. From the actual administration team itself, the bigger complex item that I see is that there's never a new team put in place. No one knows who's going to be the new stock administrator. They're not sure if they're going to use a different vendor or the current vendor. They don't have personnel in place. And so now it's, it's a whole um, kind of mystery. It's this black box of who's going to do what and when. And it tends to fall on the uh, Remain Code team to, to get that in place and to start training the new company. Because remember, whoever ends up being the SpinCo, that stock administrator may need to know historical information about the stock plan to know what the impact was on their stock as it was converted. So it's very, very tricky to get those pieces in place. And we don't usually see it happening until too late in the process. And then it's that whole thing again, and Sorrel mentioned it, who is actually going to do the adjustments to the equity? Is it your equity vendor? Can they actually provide that service? Uh, what's the timeline for that? Is there a contract that has to be put in place? Are there other service providers out there that can help you? Is it going to be done internally? How is it going to be done? Who's going to oversee it? I mean, the questions are just endless. But if you don't get that kind of laid out in a timeline or a calendar, as soon as you start hearing the rumbling of a spinoff, uh, you're going to probably fall way behind, and you want to be ahead of it as much as possible. Some more administration issues, and this is where I'm going to finally answer the question that was asked. Performance awards, payout, or adjust the performance met metrics. This is always thought of, as Sorrel said, at the last minute. Uh, what are we going to do about those performance awards? Because all of a sudden, the criteria or the metrics that we were using has been broken apart, right? You've, you've split the company into pieces, and um, there's just no way to uh, figure out what the new performance metric should be. So in some cases, it may be that they decide to pay out performance at the target level at the spinoff. Uh, and how, who's going to manage that? And how is that going to happen? And is it going to be based on the uh, pre-spinoff numbers? Is it going to be adjusted? And it's very, very uh, time consuming and a very big piece of the puzzle. So you want to make sure that you understand how that's going to happen and if your system can actually handle that. The data considerations or the actual conversion of the awards themselves is where it gets a little bit tricky because of the rules in trying to keep participants tax neutral, if you will, as Sorrel mentioned. Uh, we tend to see, and the general rule is that you've got to keep certain ratios intact. And, that, and that's going to be a little deep for this call, but there are ratios that have to be maintained to ensure that the tax uh, is not incurred by the participant, that you're not benefiting them in any way. 
So you generally see rounding rules put in place in the Employee Matters Agreement, which is part of the, the filings that the SPINCO actually does, that indicate how the shares will be rounded. So if there's fractional shares, uh, if the shares are um, going to be a, you know, um, a fraction is created in the actual conversion ratio, you would have to decide whether you're going to round up, round down, drop, or pay out. What we tend to see is that they are just rounded down and there's no cash payout. Uh, we just will see that the, the shares get rounded down while the price, especially with a stock option grant, is rounded up. And so therefore, the participant is not provided any benefit and that usually relates to no taxable event. If it's decided that shares, if there's a fraction created, especially with like a restricted stock award or restricted stock unit, the fraction may be paid out in cash. Of course, that is a taxable event to the individual. Um, and so that becomes another piece that you have to figure out and know who's going to make the payment and how those payments will be made. But we tend to see that the shares are rounded um, down so that there's no benefit to the individual. Uh, we tend to want to flag accounts so that we know when we're doing the data conversions uh, which grants are being uh, adjusted, if there's user fields in your system that you can use, anything that you can do to tag the grant so you know what grant is going into what bucket when you're doing your conversions. Um, another thing to consider when you're doing conversions from the administration side is your grant numbers. And if you want to at all keep the original grant number in place, if that has any meaning to the individual, and if you want to add prefix, prefixes or suffixes, whatever you need to do to make it easy for folks to remember where that grant came from. And you know, as, as Sorrell brought up earlier, there's this whole, if I'm going to a new vendor, if I'm staying with a new vendor, what am I going to see from a SPINCO perspective uh, what do I see if I'm the employee of SpinCo? Do I see all of my history from the past? Do I see only my new company? Uh, where do I go for the history? Uh, all these things um, from an administrator point of view, you, you get to figure out and answer all these questions. So you want to know what's going on. And then once you get through the conversion, you want the auditors or someone to truly sign that off. And if you're not doing the work, and you have a vendor that's doing it for you, they're going to want a final sign-off before it's all said and done. And you want to know who that person is going to be. And as I said, testing, testing, testing. Um, you can't test enough because you always will find that there's something that, that creeps in to your conversion um, mechanism, whatever, whatever way you're converting your grants. Something is going to come up that you want to be able to understand and be ahead of the curve and not get it later on in the process. Other administrations, the tax rates for individuals. Um, when you do a basket approach, this gets very complicated because you have the employee has equity in both companies. And you need to know who's going to be paying those taxes if it's the um, SPINCO or the Remain Co. You may have to have linkages built between your equity systems and your payroll systems so that you can receive the year-to-date information, uh, payroll tax rates, as well as all income from the equity being uh, exercised or released. Uh, and, and for you know, T W-2 or 1099 reporting, you need to know who's going to be responsible for those pieces and how is that linkage going to be maintained you might become very close friends with the other stock administration team for a very long time. Sometimes companies will implement a blackout so that you have time to actually do the conversion. Sometimes they don't. And um, you, you want to ask those questions up front. We've talked about the riff of employees and the treatment, so, you know, which way are they going to go. And I think Sorrell has talked a little bit about reverse splits when the Remain Co. is in existence. Um, and how that can impact the equity as well. So administration is not a, a, you know, an easy task when you're talking about a spinoff. Uh, and anything that's decided is going to impact you not only in the current, but in the future world as well. I think there's some other issues um, relative to international 
Sorrell, that you want to cover too. I know we're getting a little bit close on time, so um, I'll let you take those. All right, and I will try and cover these thoroughly yet quickly. Um, we've we've talked again, and I, I won't beat a dead horse on this one, but even though we may have adjustments here to equity awards that are tax neutral to U.S. participants, they may not be in other countries. Just make sure that you know the countries that your that you will be in, that your company will be in, because they probably they might change. When you're spinning off part of the business, you may have a country disappear off your radar. And if there is going to be a taxable event, you need to know who is going to help the employees with that, who's going to communicate to them, possibly is the company going to provide them any sort of tax equalization on that. When you're reviewing your specific countries and you're getting everything in line, make sure that you take into account vacation and holidays, not only here in the U.S., but also outside of the U.S. Uh, you don't want to be trying to finalize something in Asia during Chinese New Year. That is not a good thing. You won't find anyone at work. Because you're going to have to involve in this timeline probably local legal counsel, Definitely tax experts. Possibly you may even have to go talk to works councils. And works councils will take forever. So just make sure that you build this into your timeline. Your tax qualified plans, you may retain the qualified status on these plans, but you need to check it out ahead of time. Don't just assume that you will. Or you may have to go and obtain new approvals. The tax authorities may want to talk to someone about this. Again, they don't move at the speed of sound. They move at the speed of a snail. So make sure that you build this in as well. And especially in the tax qualified plans, red flags in UK, France, and Israel. You will need to talk to somebody about those. Now, the big red flag of all time, China says the bane of all of our existences. This becomes interesting because SPINCO cannot start the application for China Safe until the spin date. So you can have everything in line. You can, even if you knew your ratio beforehand, you could have all your data, but they will not talk to you until you are a standalone company. So that means if you're the SPINCO administrator, not only are you calculating everything and you're dealing with all of this, but legal may be on you, hey, when can we start the China Safe application? When can we get the data? Remember, depending on the province you're in, the time that you have to devote to this process, the time that your legal department or your outside law firm has to devote. Approval can take between three and 12 months. Now, three months, you might not have any activity during that time for your China nationals. But 12 months, chances are you're going to have some activity. And how are you going to handle that when you don't have a China safe filing on the books? something that you need to think about. You need to talk to management about it because HR is going to need to talk to the Chinese nationals and give them full warning, hey, that vesting event that's going to happen in 30 days really isn't going to happen. The other item that you need to think about is cash payments that may result from the spend to employee shareholders. Some companies prefer to pay those either via payroll or accounts payable, rather than having the transfer agent go ahead and disperse those funds. Again, another question to ask when you're talking about international issues. So next, Julie, would you like to cover the accounting issues? No, I, really, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about the accounting issues. <laughs> Yeah, there, there is a lot of accounting issues when it comes to spinoffs uh, and equity. Uh, 
we talked a little bit about complications with performance awards. But one thing that we didn't talk about, and from an accounting point of view, is the 162M impact. And whatever you do with your performance awards, the finance team or whoever is on the spin team that comes from the finance side should be aware of what is happening with the performance awards and what that might do to the 162M exclusions and how they might uh, report those because it may have a very large impact if they decide to uh, just remove all the performance criteria and pay them out. Uh, they're no longer subject or they're no longer uh, treated under 162M. So, you know, there's a lot of impacts uh, to the 162M as a result of performance awards being adjusted in a spinoff. So um, if you're on the call and you're with the accounting team, you probably already are well aware of that. Uh, with the actual adjustment of the conversion of the outstanding awards, there tends to be some incremental expense or modification of the valuation, if you will, uh, on the actual awards themselves, options and awards. And it may impact both Remainco and Spinco. So we tend to see that there's an outside advisor or evaluation team that is brought in uh, by accounting to make sure that they can calculate what those new valuations might be because that would have to be, of course, input into your equity platform or whatever method you use to calculate your ongoing expense for those awards. And as part of that, it, like I said, it might be in your equity plan, but the question may be, is that something that your equity plan can actually track? So there's going to be some discussion that needs to take place within finance to understand what the relationship is uh, with the converted awards and how it's impacting things like your deferred tax assets that are on the books and where are those going uh, with, the, with the companies. And, and sometimes that's actually defined in some of the uh, pre-filings like the Employee Matters Agreement or the Separation and Distribution Agreements. Uh, it'll actually talk to those and what's happening. But those are all pieces that have to be thought out as you're uh, figuring out how to do the accounting for the actual spinoff. And if you are doing a basket approach or a shareholder approach where your equity is being assigned to, um, your, your doesn't matter where you are, you're getting both equities, there could be non-employee versus employee considerations for accounting as well that have to be talked through. And the, um, as Sorrell said with the international, if the spin date is on a month end or a quarter end or a year end, wow, um, all of that has to be thought through and how are you going to separate that uh, to make sure that you have all the reporting in the right places in that very critical time frame because not only is the spin date a critical date, but if you're doing your financial reporting at the same time, uh, you might get a little gray it might just become a little overwhelming. And uh, next we have some shareholder issues. I think, Sorrel, you're, you're going to tell us about those as well, right? I am. So frequently, Synco will have a road show. Um, executives will go out and they will, it, it's just like any other IPO, they'll go out on a road show. And normally during that time, there'll be a blackout at Remainco. Because Spinco is still part of Remainco. And one of the questions to ask is, do we have a road show? Do we have a blackout? When is that going to be? And I know we're covering some shareholder issues. I know most of us are not in investor relations as well. But trust me, these are things that will affect you or you will get questions on. Additionally, I think, sir, sir, I think we're running a little short on time. But I think the other thing is that with the shareholder issues, they really have an impact too on what you can communicate to your employees, right? Absolutely. You you can't communicate when in a quiet period. So you know these things are are definitely things that you should be asking. Uh, we've talked about the distribu uh, We've talked about being tax neutral, and we talked about it in converting the awards. But is the distribution of shares itself 
a tax neutral event? Well, the answer is that in the U.S., most of the time, since U.S. lawyers and accountants have structured the deal, the answer is normally yes. However, for international residents, it is rarely a yes. You will have employees coming to you complaining. So you need to get in front of that, talk to HR. Are we going to do any sort of tax supplement? Uh, will we distribute them outside of the company? Because remember, international employees are shareholders too. In terms of cost basis advice, where will it be posted? Will you give any? Normally, there is a very specific sheet of instructions on the calculation of cost basis for the shares that result from the deal. It is called a Form 8937. It is filed with the IRS. Ask IR for a copy. They will be really impressed that you have asked specifically for Form 8937. And again, employees will come to you. They will come to, to IR to ask for that. They'll come to you. Additionally, distributions of cash. Will there be any fractional shares paid out? How will they be paid out? In what currency? Normally, fractional shares aggregated, sold on the market, and then divvied up, and basically put back through the brokerage firm where the shareholder was holding the shares. And usually, it's in USD. Um, some of your employees may not be happy about that, but there's really just not a lot that we can do about it. Next, talking quickly about communication. Basically, remember this. Repeat what you've told them. Remind employees what you've told them. Repeat it and remind. Use your communications to build on and use them as building blocks. Be sure not to provide details too soon or information too soon. Again, if the calculations change five times, you don't want to have told the employees, hey, we're going to do a three to one ratio. And then they find out that's not right. They'll be upset. And it's easier to say nothing until you know than to have to correct yourself. Also remember that different populations will have different concerns. Now, clearly, everybody wants to know the timing of the deal and the ratios. But the 10 v 5 one plan holders, they're going to want to know, hey, what happens to my plan at spin? Whereas normal employees aren't going to care what happens to 10 v 5 one plans at spin. So consider some tailored, directed communications to your groups. It will help you, and it will cut down on your questions. Also, equity in the offer letters pre-spend. How many shares are employees really going to receive? Instead of giving numbers out, you really might want to consider using a dollar range. You'll receive $10,000 worth of stock options or $5,000 worth of RSPs. Again, we've talked about the blackout, but you really need to give ample notice, especially for the option holders who may have something expiring during that time. You'll need to talk to the employees about how their vesting during the blackout will be treated, especially if you've got a large RSU or RSA population, and how long that blackout will be. And make sure that when you tell them it's going to be three weeks, it really is three weeks. You don't go four weeks or six weeks. Give them a good idea and communicate soon. Now, I think we covered just about everything, and we've got a minute left. Any last comments, Julie? Nope, I think uh, we need to turn it over to Shauna to wrap us up. And if anyone has any further questions, feel free to send them to Stock and Options Solutions, and Shauna will give you some information about that. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Julie and Sorrell, for speaking today. Um, and I would like to thank all of you for attending today's educational webcast. Please look for an email in the next day or two with links to the recording and materials. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.